Hey, Mysterions, I'm Shay. And I'm Jen. And this, this is, is Crimes, Crimes, Cryptids, and, and Controversies. We're getting good at that. <laughs> <laughs> this is a weekly true crime and paranormal podcast where we work our butts off to try and surprise one another and our Mysterions each week with new knowledge. Sometimes we get excited and we post more than once a week, so don't forget to subscribe and keep up with our random uploads. With that being said, let's explore. <laughs> Elizabeth Diane Downs shot her three children on a dark, remote road near Springfield, Oregon in May of 1983. It was around this time that she had an affair with a very cute and very married man named Lou Lewiston, who not only refused to leave his wife despite the affair, but also had zero interest in having children. Is the murder and affair related? We'll see. But first, news break. Halloween was extra scary this year for multiple families in Oregon who found razor blades in their children's candy. What? Yeah. Again. Again. These people never quit. The razor appears to be something similar to a pencil sharpener blade, officers said in a statement. The initial reporting party discovered the small razor blade after checking their child's candy prior to allowing them to consume it. According to the police department, each of the incidents took place in the neighborhood of Eugene, which is about 110 miles south of Portland, Oregon. This case is still unfolding. We'll keep you updated as it unfolds. And now into today's story. All right, let's start out with um, Young Life. <laughs> young Life Diane's sounds like a, life. a church meeting. Yeah, I know. That's and now we're it. going to Young Life. Let's go, children. Let's start out with Diane's early years. Elizabeth Diane Downs was born on August 7th, 1955 in Phoenix, Arizona to teen parents Wesley Linden and Willa Dean Engel Fredrickson. Diane alleged that because her parents were teen parents, they were unable to give her the love that she needed. She was also super averse to her father's lectures, strict rules, and how little positive attention he gave her because her parents were too busy hanging out together. Quote, he spent way too much time with my mom, and my mom spent no time with me. End quote, Down says. By the time she was a school student, Diane was considered bright, but not one of the in crowd. Due to her conservative, old-time Baptist parents' rules, Diane was resigned to dowdy clothing. They forbade trendy clothing and fads, resulting in their daughter being considered a loser. Wherever she went, she was the square, the ugly duckling. In a sudden shift, when Diane turned 13, she was allowed to enroll in a charm school. I thought that was fake. I really thought yeah. charm schools were something in those haughty... Potty totty type. Yeah. Upper environment, like um, a debutante ball type yes. thing mm -hmm. in line with Disney princesses type vibes. Similar, or like where they sit and teach table manners or how to sit properly as a young as lady. A slouch. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I went. <laughs> right. So Diane really thrived in the charm school and soaked up all the fashion and makeup tips and emerged as a new Diane with her mousy brown hair, bleached blonde, and cut fashionably in new trendy clothing. And the local boys begin to notice. Diane ate up all this attention that she never got as a child. I can only imagine that that went straight to her Oh, head. for sure, Zs. So now on to Diane's marriage and her kids. During her high school career at Moon Valley High School in Phoenix, Diane met her husband, Steve Downs. After high school, Diane and Steve parted ways for a little while as Diane enrolled at Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College in Orange, California. Meanwhile, Steve went on to serve in the Navy. Diane was quickly expelled from the religious school after only a year for promiscuity. What? <laughs> While Stephen was still off serving, and Diane returned to her parents' home in Arizona. On November 13th of 1973, Diane and Stephen were married. Oh, they got back together. Oh, yeah. Diane described Stephen as being as dominating as her own father. However, people still alleged that they were instantly attached at the hip. From the beginning, the marriage was at best shaky. Diane wanted love and realized too late that Steve was not that love. Quote, I suppose I potentially thought he could be a miniature of my dad. I did not marry Steve for love. I married Steve to get out of the family. End quote. She found solace when she became pregnant. Carrying a baby made her feel for the first time that she was actually in charge of a love that was all dependent on her. 
So, like, arguably, she did not marry to get out of the family, as she says, because she just went from one dominant hand to another. And she was born in 55, so at this age, she's, what, 18? Mm -hmm. Honestly, she's not even grown yet. She doesn't even know what love is. She doesn't know what she wants. She's just trying to figure out life. As we've all learned, our brains aren't even formed till we're 26. So what we did in our teens and our early 20s, we all look back at and go, oh... So I realized the other day I was talking to Crawford and I go, I remember when I was like 20 or 21 and I was like, I don't believe in regrets. I'm never going to have a regret. Mm-hmm. And now at 29, I'm like, uh-uh, nope. I regret a lot actually because I said a lot of dumb, ignorant shit when I was younger and hurt a lot of feelings without meaning to. Like I said, I have children who are over that age and it's interesting to watch them develop and mm-hmm. how they respond to things and how they're like, oh, I understand that now, mom. <laughs> or thanks, mom. I get it now. Or just, yeah. you know, they've proven your brain is not done growing maturity wise or anything until you're 26 so yeah and then you can gain that empathy and that world experience to she's be not like, there oh. yet she's young oh, she was sheltered yeah. for a while she got to go be rambunctious and do whatever <laughs> she wanted to an extent for a little bit for like and a she, year <laughs> and she doesn't be. know yet what mm-hmm. love is no you know she just at this point it's kind of like a lust type thing and like this sounds stupid but like you know love at the depth that you have experienced it so I remember being 13 and being like I'm in love with this guy and my mom's like shut up you don't even know what love is and I was like okay but from my perspective I did from that age you yeah. did yeah so it's like she thinks she's in love based on the only type of love that she's experienced which was never healthy right and and that's her perspective mm-hmm. we all have different reality. perspectives exactly so let's see it was a feeling of power Diana had never before realized, and she relished in the delight that she was the Helms woman of her own path to total love. Diane and Stephen's first child was named Christy Ann and was born in 1974. She describes Christy as the first good friend she had ever had, which right there shows you Diane's mental yeah, state. Yeah, she wants a kid A baby for... can't be your friend. No, and she wants it as like, oh, this will love me. It has no choice. I'm like, right. that's not a good reason. Mm, exactly. Quote, Christy was the first person that really really just plain loved me end quote diane said once the initial attention from her first baby wore off it was back to serving steve his meals never mind that she had a baby to care for and worked part-time at the local thrift store too cheryl lynn followed in 1976 who diane described as a colicky child it was obvious to everybody that diane favored her firstborn christy ann She ended her next pregnancy with an abortion, but then, after seeing pictures of fetuses at an anti-abortion booth at a local fair, she regretted it. This part's kind of tricky because it's like the argument of pro-life stuff. So, like, I just want to say now we're not taking a stance on either side. We're just reading you the information, okay? Yeah, we try to keep it as unbiased as possible. Yeah. And non-political as possible. Here's the information. We're not going to give you an opinion on this. Right. If we give you an opinion, we'll let you know. Yes, exactly. Sometime during the trial, Diane said, quote, I felt the need to do something to make amends for what I had done wrong. When I had the abortion, I was led to believe that a six-week fetus is nothing more than mucus. End quote. Throughout 1976 and 1977, Diane took the kids and ran away from Steve several times, but she always came back, be it of her own volition or by force. Steve would hunt her down to one of her many relatives' homes, but once reunited, the cycle would restart. Well, they call it a cycle for a reason, so... Mm -hmm. Steve was unhappy, Diane was unhappy, but the marriage waned on. By that time, in 1978, the family had moved to Mesa, still in Arizona. Both Diane and Steve worked for the same mobile home manufacturer. By this time, Steve had decided that the two kids were enough and got a vasectomy. Well, wow! Oh, just wait. Oh, go Steve! (laughs) Yeah, well... However, Diane decided again to conceive, but not Steve's baby. I had a feeling after I read that, (laughs) just a disclaimer so you guys remember how we like to record things. I know the basics of Diane Downs, but I don't read everything that Shay did so I can have natural reactions or natural questions, and then I'll do the same thing to her in reverse with another case. Yeah, we're intentionally aloof when it comes to this. Right. While working the assembly line, Diane found her stud named Mark Sager. Hopefully I said that right. Whom Probably. she passionately seduced and conceived a baby with. Stephen Daniel, who they would nickname Danny. The product of that affair was born four days after Christmas in 1979. Steve was furious, but even though the child was not his, Steve accepted the boy as his own and lived with it. 
However, she would also say that sometimes Stephen would beat her. Sometimes Diane would scream at her own children, which later worried her so much that she wrote a short essay about child abuse while attending an Arizona community college part-time. The couple divorced in 1980 because Steve was finally fed up with the thought that Danny was the result of an extramarital affair from Diane. Still, the marriage had reached its ebb and within a year the Downs decided to divorce. Diane moved in with the father of Danny, and it was during this time she began to change. Diane found a new sense of freedom after her divorce and decided that she also wanted to feel free from her children. Uh-oh. Yeah, good parenting. Oh boy. Her children were often seen unkempt and appeared malnourished. Downs would routinely leave Christy in charge of her other two kids when the girl was only six years old. Diane preferred to work, stay away from home, and throw her kids on any babysitter that she could find. One sitter relates an incident that even though she didn't know it at the time foreshadowed tragedy, quote, Diane put everything before those kids. If Danny wanted attention, she would push him away. But the worst thing was, one time, I caught Cheryl jumping on the bed and I said that was not permitted. I made her sit in a chair and think about it. Cheryl sat quietly for a while and then she looked up. Do you have a gun here? Of course not, why? I want to shoot myself. My mom says I'm bad. End quote. What? She I was six? Chills. Yeah. That's not a great sign. That's bad. That's just hard to even digest. Yeah. At six or seven or eight or. Like you've just decided the that. The child you know just asked it. this person if they had a gun. Yeah. That's not the best outcome psychologically for a child. Probably. Oh. So now we're on to Lou Lewiston and other extramarital affairs. By the way, Lou Lewiston, that was his alias during, like, court proceedings and everything. His name's actually Robert Knickerbocker. Well, that's very interesting, because I keep looking at Lou Lewiston, and I'm like, what parent does that to their child? (laughs) dick. (laughs) Right. Right. So, Diane finally found a full-time position with the U.S. Post Office in 1981, and she was stationed in Chandler, Arizona. It's there that she met Lou Lewiston, a.k.a. Robert Knickerbocker, and she fell in love. Plot twist. He didn't. For once, it was the other party, not Diane, to make the decision when and where the love affair would end. Uh Mm Uh-oh. As she had done mentally to her own kids, Lou physically walked out of her life. Although she had had several affairs with co-workers at the post office, she testified, she felt more comfortable with Nick, as she called him, than with any other man in her life. Oh my goodness. But it was this quote-unquote on-again, off-again relationship as Knickerbocker testified and in April of 1983 anxious for a new life Downs moved her little butt to Oregon with her kids by the way I realize I should probably throw that in there by that time her father had become the postmaster in Springfield and Diane saw it as a good place to move ahead in the company yeah because like if she's already in the post office she can ask for a transfer yeah I mean that seems like nepotism and probably conflict of interest but it's fine well I mean it was yeah. the 80s no one gave yeah. a fuck <laughs> exactly <laughs> Quote, I have more advantages than most people. My dad's name pulls power. Unquote. She wrote in her diary. Wait, this is still the same Diane who said that her dad never gave her love or uh-huh. affection as a child. She didn't get what she needed from him. Yep. Okay, just check in. Yeah, 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 yeah. She hoped that Knickerbocker would leave his wife, Charlene, and join her in Oregon. That spring, she began writing unmailed letters in her diary. Homegirl loves the written word. She does not fucking stop writing things down, be it in a diary or two people. She plays herself with this is what I'm going to say. I have a few diary entries that I would love to read to the court. (laughs) All right. On April 21st, 1983, she writes, quote, I still think of you as my best friend and lover, and you keep telling me to go away and find someone else. Unquote. Next, April 29, same year. Quote, It doesn't matter what Charlene says. I'm a little sad that she has convinced you that the kids would be a burden because I know it would not be true. Unquote. And our third one, May 11th, same year. Quote, I have three beautiful children that I love more than anyone else. I think I love them even more than you now. Danny says he's my best buddy, and I'm his best buddy. He always gives me kisses and hugs. Every morning when I go to work, he waves and says, quote, Bye, Mom. Pick me up after work. I love you. Unquote. It was around this time that Diane started to crave the attention that the babies had given her previously, so she decided that now was an excellent time to become a surrogate. Oh, boy. Oh, boy is right. 
Diane tried to become a surrogate, but failed twice when the psychiatric tests indicated signs of psychosis. And I'm going to interrupt myself. Why the hell did no one intervene at this point? You would think they'd do some sort of, like, well check. Or am I wrong? Like, is that not how that works? No. No, because, I mean, like, so when you say signs of psychosis, it Uh could be depression. It could be anxiety. It could be anything. And so, and I know about this because I was going to have a surrogate help me with another child. However, that's another story. (laughs) You need somebody that you know is going to mentally be better than okay because Mm -hmm. they're going to have to hand a child over. So if you feel like they're in any kind of psychosis as into unstable with depression, anxiety, not doing well with relationships... You don't want that person to carry your child because they're not going to be able to detach and hand the baby over. But much oh. less for you, what about for them? Yeah. Are they going to be okay or are you going to escalate them into suicide or homicide? Or God. You see what I mean? So Okay. But on a sidebar, according to all of the reproductive endocrinologists, I saw having an abortion almost knocks you out right away. Oh, shit. Like, really? Is it just abortion it... or miscarriage? And that would be oh. she already had three pregnancies. Usually don't want you to have more than two. Like, you know, and I don't know. It depends on the time. This was back a In while ago. <laughs> so Again, maybe no back then it was newer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, it's pretty strict now. But obviously it's a good idea for her to not. Yeah, maybe stop getting pregnant. And And what's interesting to me is that she actually failed because she seems like a very smart woman. Like she's obviously Mm -hmm. able to manipulate lots of people. It is very hard back then to fail a psychiatric. I'm very intrigued (laughs) on what it was that she said. I know. Ugh. Okay. So they said nor because Psycho says, she says, quote, I was so happy. It was the most stable time in my whole life. I had a purpose for being here. And that's been my whole hang up since I was a little kid. Why am I here? Just so my dad can yell at me? Just so my husband can criticize me? Just to take care of my kids? But these people needed me. It made me somebody. I told the parents that the baby did more for me than I ever did for them. Unquote. Um, I'm sorry, did she actually become a surrogate? Because it kind of sounds like she did. Yes, she did. Okay. So she failed it twice. So she, obviously she psychiatric shopped. Yeah. She kept going to psychiatrist to psychiatrist to figure it out. And then she probably like learned what to figured say. out what she said that was wrong. Mm-hmm. Or she asked somebody and then she just went to another one until she could get it right and yep. pass it. So she was able to become a surrogate. And on May 8th, 1982, Diane gave birth to her daughter, whom she named Jennifer, before relinquishing her parental right. Quote, I looked at the baby between my knees down there and my first thought was of the mother. There were tears running down her face and she wouldn't let go of my hand. All she could say was thank you. Diane said, she also said, quote, People have wondered why I won't regret this, giving up the baby. And that's very easy to answer. When you kill a child, when you have an abortion, you've terminated something. You've murdered somebody. It's cruel. It's horrible. It's terrible. But when you do something out of love, when you carry a child for somebody else and turn that life over to them, you haven't done anything bad. And it's nothing you look back on and regret. It's good. Said Diane to the Washington Post in actually just a completely unrelated interview about surrogate mothers in February of 1983. So... Shay, do you happen to know if this was a surrogacy of Diane and another man? Or was this a traditional surrogacy where Diane's partner impregnated this surrogate? I honestly have no idea. That would be interesting to know because then like the attachment, if she knew it was her baby versus was it this other woman's egg? Oh, I see what you're saying. Was it like an embryo from this other woman or was it an egg that they implanted in this woman or was it just Diane's partner or Mm -hmm. a random man who got this woman pregnant? Like, I'm just curious, like what, how easy was it for her to let go? Oh, and you see she doesn't. So just hold on to that. Oh, okay. So maybe it was her child. Yeah, just wait. Okay. (laughs) I feel like I say it every episode. We'll get there. (laughs) There you go. So Diane, again, loves the written word and wrote another letter in her diary to Jennifer saying, quote, Hello, baby. How is your life? I think about you often and wonder what goes on with you week by week. 
Did you know that today is Mother's Day as well as your birthday? You and your mommy must be really having a big celebration. I don't know exactly what to say to you, Jenny, so I'll just say what's on my mind. Don't give yourself and your love to anyone unless you are sure they are worthy. And when the heartbreak comes, don't try to chase it away. It can't be done. Accept the pain and learn from it. A wonderful man once told me that if something was worth waiting for, then wait for it. I believe him, my love, and you should too. Goodbye, Jennifer. I love you. Unquote. Okay, Hemingway, fucking chill, dude. Like, shut up. It's annoying because it's like, okay, well, why don't you read that to yourself and maybe absorb that information and use that moving forward, Diane? Yeah, it's almost like she's pretending to be something she's not. Exactly. Like, what about her other kids that, you yeah, know, she can't what, give them her, this her child's advice? asking for a gun to kill herself and you're worried about giving this other little Jennifer great life advice? Yeah, no, no. Fuck the other kids, apparently. It's Jennifer. She wants what she can't have. Yes, Running that's theme. a Leo. You, that's a Diane. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying anything bad about Leos. I, I love every sign. I'm not saying that. I'm just, it's just fun. We just don't love the shithead versions of any signs. So. There you go, equally. So Diane was employed by the USPS assigned to the mail routes in the city of Cottage Grove, Oregon. She wrote in one of the unmailed letters that make up her diary, quote, You know I don't want a daddy for my kids. You would never be left alone with them. Unquote. Um, she left her kids with everybody, didn't she? Yeah. Well, okay. So she was writing that to Lou because he was like, bitch, I don't want your kids. I don't oh. want kids. I'd have a kid if I wanted kids. And he was still married. Uh-huh. And she goes, no, no, I wouldn't leave you with them. What a lie. Yeah. She leaves her kids with everybody. Mm -hmm. Although, you know what? I would argue that that's not a lie, specifically because if her kids aren't with him, that means she can go bump uglies and do whatever with him. That's so she true. wouldn't want to leave her kids with him. It's true. Yep. So, anyhow. All right. Let's switch over to talk about the murder. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry <laughs> that, that transition sorry. into that. On May 19th of 1983, Diane and her three children went to Diane's friend's house and hung out in the evening. Diane left sometime around 10 p.m. And as she was driving home, she decided that she wanted to take a back road just to explore. So they turned down Old Mohawk Road. There were thick woods on one side and an overground field on the other. The river was nearby. Diane said she had been driving for a little while when she says she came to a small bend in the road. Diane said that a shaggy-haired stranger flagged down her 1983 Nissan Pulsar. Diane stopped, got out of the car, and asked him if she could help, and his response was, quote, I want your car, end quote. She replied, quote, You've got to be kidding, end quote. When she refused, he turned a gun on her three children. Cheryl in the front seat was shot twice, once each in the heart and lungs. Christy was shot twice in the chest, and Danny once in the back. Wow, that's so sad. It's really sad. Downs was shot in the left arm. Quote, I felt like I was in a nightmare. It's one of those things where you want to do something, you know you should do something, but you're not there really. End quote. Diane says she pretended to throw her keys into the field next to her, got back in the car, then sped to the hospital. However, according to another driver who was stuck behind Diane, he alleged that she couldn't have been going more than five miles per hour. Wow. She fucked herself right from the beginning. When the three children were brought into McKenzie Willamette Hospital, the scene was an emergency physician's nightmare, in the words of John Mackey, the doctor in charge that night. Both hospital workers and police have testified that Downs was unusually controlled under the circumstances. Quote, what I observed was a woman who was very calm, very self-assured, not tearful, not angry, occasionally smiling, occasionally chuckling. I saw a woman who appeared to be in a very good control of herself, end quote, Mackey testified. With Sherry Lynn already dead, Dr. Steve Wilhite got to work on saving Christie's life. Wilhite recalled thinking Christie was dead. He saved her life and updated Downs, but her response was very suspicious to him. Quote, not one tear. You know, she just asked, how is she doing? Not one emotional reaction. She says things to me like, boy, this has really spoiled my vacation. And she also says, that really ruined my new car. I got blood all over the back of it. I knew within 30 minutes of talking with that woman that she was guilty, end quote. But Downs' mother says that her daughter was hysterical that night. Okay. Quote, she was crying when I walked in. She said, Mom, I can't live without my kids. I said, don't worry. They'll be okay. 
she was crying because she got her car fucked up. Now well, she has I to mean, get it reupholstered. If you go back to her original story and follow Diane's perspective, her parents were controlling. Mm-hmm. They didn't give her the love she needed, and she had to be a certain way to please them. So obviously, she's, she's going to put on the Diane show. Yeah, why wouldn't she? So I'm not surprised. Mm-mm. Regardless, the police were obviously involved and they quickly stepped in to help identify the murderer. Downs lied and said she didn't own a gun, but a search warrant revealed otherwise. Police also found her diary, which was filled with references to Knickerbocker and his hesitancy about the relationship. The witness who saw her drive slowly after the shooting only furthered suspicions. Diane was arrested on February 28, 1984. Things would go from bad to worse for Diane, who saw a glimmer of hope that she may not be found guilty when Christie regained her speech. It took months of therapy for Christy to trust her therapist enough to tell on her mom. The therapist would have Christy write down who the shooter was, then they would immediately burn the note. That way, Christy could build up the trust. One day, Christy found the courage to reply when the therapist asked who shot her. Quote, my mom. End quote. Wow. Isn't that... Fucked up. Like, I really like that <sighs> therapist method, though. The write and burn method. It's just so sad. It's horrible because now her sister's dead. I want to say her and, brother's in a coma right now. And Christy was supposed to be her favorite. Because Christy's the first one, the one that she liked, right? And then Cheryl Lynn followed in 76 and she was the colicky. Okay, well, at least she got to keep her favorite. I don't love that redemption arc. No, but you know what? It's more revealing because if this was her favorite child (gasps) and she says that she did it, it would be more trusting than for a child who didn't like her mom to say it. That's true. That's probably why she was like, ew, she'll defend me. It's okay. I've been nice to her. Right? Jeez. Okay, well... On May 8th, 1984, Diane was charged with the murder of her own child, Cheryl Lynn Downs, who at the time was just seven, and the attempted murder and first-degree assault of her two children, Christy Ann Downs, who was nine, and Stephen Daniel Downs, which she pled not guilty. Fucking shocker. Well, People lined up outside of the courtroom as early as seven in the morning to get a seat three hours later when the trial began. Most were housewives who took careful notes. Wow. Downs' behavior at the hospital is what made the first investigators suspect her, although she wasn't charged until later that year. One of Diane's lawyers, Jagger, explained the coolness she showed toward hospital workers by maintaining that Downs was taught by her father to severely control her emotions, and she said, quote, I've never really been allowed to cry. So Downs shocked the court by showing up to her trial heavily pregnant. Oh boy. However, it was made clear that the baby would go into custody by the state of Oregon immediately after birth. Downs was divorced and had refused to publicly say who the father was, saying, quote, I didn't have any friends after all of this happened. He was a young, single, attractive, well, you've been listening to my life on the stand, you know. Unquote. Wow. What? Playing games. Yeah. During the trial, prosecution and defense were trying to use the surrogate mother twist to their advantage. The prosecutor, Fred Hughey, implies that only a callous woman would give up a child for money, while their defense lawyer, Jim Jagger, argues that surrogate motherhood was much more important to Down than the married man the prosecution told the jury that she was obsessed with, to the point of killing the children she felt that he did not want. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't like to usually interject my opinions, but since I've been through this side of it, and I'll respect his opinion about giving up a child. um, Yeah. We're not talking about a child that she went out and purposefully got pregnant with and needed to find a home for. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a child that before conception, she had an agreement with somebody that that person would pay for her medical care, pay for the time off that she had, pay for her clothes, pay for things that she needed to maintain a pregnancy. And that's what the money is for. The money is not just here, have fun it yeah. costs money to be pregnant you might yeah. need to take time off you've got to go to doctor's appointments it costs extra gas and mileage to go to these specialists it pays to go to the doctor you've got medications you might yeah. have to take to maintain the pregnancy the money is not so big in the end of doing something for someone for nine or ten months it's not a huge amount of money that's left after no everything is said and done so to say that somebody just hands a baby over for money is uneducated. It is. It's very ignorant of yeah. him to say. I hate to say it, but it was the 80s. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, it's true. It's true. The understanding yeah, lots, of Lots of people weren't very... Exactly. 
they weren't very knowledgeable about it. So we're going to chalk it up to ignorance. And this is the one time we're going to voice the opinion that, no, we don't agree. You're not just like paying to I'm playing the kid. other side. Yes. You can have his side. Yeah. My yeah. side is I've been into this for years. And yeah. he makes it sound like she got pregnant and she just handed the baby over for some money. That's yeah. not the true no. story here. That's not how that works. After the birth of her daughter, Jennifer, in May of 1982, Dan was eager to become a surrogate mother for a second time. So in February of 1983, she was in Kentucky for three days of insemination. In the interview that would show her mental health for surrogacy, she was articulate and thoughtful. Mm-hmm. So she figured out what to say. Yeah, she cracked She figured out how to, yeah, she's very mind-oriented. Yep. Like most surrogate mothers, she had to pass a series of psychological tests, and she talked wistfully of Jennifer, but seemed to have adjusted to giving her up. She also talked without emotion about her unhappy childhood, which would become the theme at her trial. The prosecutor, arguing before the jury, said that on the night of May 19th, Diane took her children out to the area of Old Mohawk Road and then shot them, perhaps on any of the desolate logging roads that crisscrossed through the woods. Then, he said, she turned the gun on herself to support her story and began driving slowly toward the hospital about five miles an hour while she waited for her kids to bleed out and die. Christy Downs, who was brave enough to testify against her mother, sobbed on the witness stand and told the court that her mom did it. Ugh, what I, my heart breaks kid. right there. I know. Like that, I am like broken just listening to that. Real gooseies. This she has poor balls. child was the favored child uh-huh. to begin with. And that's so, already a lot of baggage. Uh, it's got to be, in, in this poor girl's mind, such a betrayal. Yeah to do this to her mom like such terror of knowing that your testimony is gonna get rid of your mom and you already lost your siblings and that you're essentially completely alone so Uh, it's okay there's a silver lining don't worry however jagger i don't really like his side of things i'm just gonna go on record and say it i don't like him oh and by the way this is diane's lawyer so that's probably why i think he's an idiot but he says that Christy saw Diane through the rear window as Diane stepped away from the attacker and that her daughter's memory had been warped by the trauma. But keep in mind, no shaggy-haired man has ever been found in relation to this. Well, and there was somebody behind her, correct? What do you mean? A car. There was another car behind her? It came up, like, way after. Like, she had time to shoot the kids and... Okay. Yeah. Another problem for the defense is that Knickerbocker testified that he saw a 22 caliber pistol in Diane's trunk the night before she left for Oregon. Don't forget that when she was interviewed in the hospital, she said, oh, I don't own a gun. What are you talking about? I've never owned a gun. Down said that she gave the pistol to her ex-husband, but a crime lab report used by the prosecution found that the 22 caliber bullet casings retrieved at the shooting site and the 22 caliber cartridge found in the rifle at Downs' apartment, quote, all were worked through the same gun, unquote. Oh. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. It's like forensics will bust your ass. Well, where's the shaggy-haired man? <laughs> in her imagination. <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> Jagger contends that sheriff's investigators, under pressure to get a suspect, took the casings from the shooting scene and planted them in the rifle. Okay. Mm-hmm. He says, quote, Can you imagine how hard it is to find a murderer when you aren't looking for one? Mom becomes real easy. Unquote. No murder weapon has ever been found, although divers did search the surrounding river that I meant or you mentioned earlier for like the next few days. Jagger also had to explain the blood splatters that were found in the outside of the car. So the prosecution claimed in court that Cheryl Downs was shot once inside of the car and once outside of the car because of the pattern of blood on the panel outside of the passenger side. So basically indicating that Diane had taken Cheryl from the car and like put her outside and shot her a second time. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. The defense had a private forensics expert testify that the blood simply could have just dripped there when the medics lifted the wounded children out of the car to the hospital. That's not how blood splatter works. Like, I'm not even a little bit of a cop, but I'm like, no, bitch. Blood drips, not bloop on the side of a car when you lift someone out, but okay. Finally, Diane had to explain why she gave different accounts of the shooting during the days after they happened. In a taped interview played in the court, she told two detectives that the shootings were committed by two men in ski masks who knew her name and also knew that she had a five-inch tattoo of a rose on her back. Stop it. Mm -hmm. Stop it. Nope. (laughs) I will not. And in a phone conversation taped by Knickerbocker, Down said her ex-husband had found a quote-unquote hitman to do the shootings. Like, she's a 
She's just implicating herself left, right, and center. Her ex-husband has testified that he thinks, personally, Diane did it. Her defense attorney, Jagger, explained the discrepancies with dreams, in other words, that Diane could not distinguish between reality and nightmares. <laughs> Quote, I felt like I was going crazy back then during June, July, and August. I didn't know what was real and what wasn't real. There's one specific dream. A person flagged our car down. Cheryl was still shot in this dream, but she's always shot in my dreams. But she's alive, and Cheryl saves us, even though she's shot. She saves us. Unquote. Diane wrote in a letter to fucking Jennifer, who just can't catch a break Yeah, from there's all. your problem right there. Mm-hmm. I don't leave one word of that after you say that. No. You don't write that to Jennifer in your journal to try to, in the future, save yourself. I was going to say, what is she trying to do? Like, she knows somebody's going to get a hold of her journals one day. Yeah. Well, so she's purposefully writing stuff. She's like trying to be like, no, Jennifer, don't believe them. Don't believe the hype. She testified that her father was sexually abusive to her when Diane was just 12 years old. According to Anne Rule's Small Sacrifices, Diane's father allegedly molested her when Diane was just 11 years old. Diane told authorities that the occurrences never led to fornication, but she was fondled and caressed. On the weekends, Diane claimed that he took her on rides to the desert. Once away from civilization, he would make her remove her blouse and bra as he watched. Diane said that these perversions ended as quietly as they had begun in Wes Frederick's... Fre- Wes Frederick's... God damn it. Wes Frederick's... God <laughs> fuck. Can you say Frederick's... Can you say it five again? times fast? I can't even say it once slowly. Fredrickson. Thank you. Became more of a typical father, as if cessation would eradicate all memories. After all of this, Diane, <laughs> thankfully, was found guilty on one charge of murder and two charges of attempted murder. You would think the story would stop there, but we still have like three pages left. So obviously it doesn't. All right, so let's talk about the topic of Diane's prison time. Diane was found guilty on one charge of murder and two charges of attempted murder on June 17th, 1984. So that makes her what? I think she was 29. I don't know why I was going to say 34. <laughs> Somewhere, somewhere around 30. How about that? Yeah. Diane was initially sent to a maximum security prison for women at Oregon's Women's Correctional Center. But on July 11th of 1987, Diane scaled the prison's chain link fence while guards weren't paying attention. All right, wait, <laughs> hold on a second. Hold on, back up, rewind. Did I say a maximum security prison for women? Yeah. At a maximum security prison for women, somebody climbed. Okay. Come on, Oregon. She probably flashed her boobs and they went, oh my God. And then she crawled out. Okay, this is bad. Yep. Using her clothes to protect her from the barbed wire. At okay, the... so she definitely flashed her boobs. <laughs> she had on a tank top, okay? <laughs> Using her clothes to protect her from the barbed wire at the top, she landed safely on the other side and made her way to the home of Wayne Seifer, whose wife was also an inmate. Wow. Mm-hmm. Got the squad. At the time, Wayne was addicted to heroin and basically living on the edge. When Diane showed up and asked if she could stay, he had no problem with that, and they entered into a brief sexual relationship. Oh, here she goes again. Yeah, don't shit where you eat, Diane. Lauren Larry Glover, a former Oregon State police detective who eventually found Diane, was worried that Diane was potentially going after her children to kidnap or hurt them. Well, you know, I agree with him on that. But I also think that maybe she's trying to get pregnant again. (gasps) I didn't even think about that. <laughs> it's my oh, first thought. Shoot. Like she went and hurried up and slept with someone. That, I, that's why I love having a second set of eyes on this that knows just the like, bare minimum overall. Because then you can be like, it's um, natural thoughts. Just trying to get pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Glover searched Diane's jail cell and found clothes, a map of Mexico, and some stationery. The paper was blank, but when Larry turned it a particular way, he could see the indentation of a map. So he sent it to the FBI who created a photostatic copy. The map had a line drawn from the prison to a house with an address written by it, which ended up being Wayne's house. The police raided Wayne's house while he was out of town with family. Diane grabbed a BB gun and attempted to induce a suicide by cop scenario, but ultimately gave up and went willingly. So dramatic. I love how she's like, fine, yes, just take me. Diane received an additional five years tacked onto her sentence, and Wayne got five years probation and six months in a restitution center in Salem, Oregon. (gasps) That means Diane could have been out on probation five years ago because she has possible parole 2025. Wow. Yup. She could have already been out. Dumbass. I mean, I'm glad she's not, but. That's crazy. Yeah. 
Diane was moved to Clinton, New Jersey, because prison officials said they wanted Downs placed in a more secure facility in a state where she is less known because she is an escape risk who constantly seeks publicity. Okay, but still, I'm just throwing it out there that they shouldn't pass the ball because she was in a maximum security and they should be able to secure any person in Oregon without having to send them to New Jersey. That's unacceptable. Yeah. On a state level, and this was the 80s, that was unacceptable. Hopefully it's fixed by now. Yeah. Oregon, we're coming for you. I'm just kidding. No, we're not. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Diane Downs is currently serving her sentence of life plus 50 years at Central California Women's Facility in Chowchilla, California, where she's been since August of 1993. For fairness sake, we're going to leave a link of the opposing view that claims that Diane is innocent, and you can find that at www.dianedowns.com. Simple and straightforward. Love that for her. I found that and I was like, this is bullshit. Yeah. But then they made some good points and I was like, no, I'm not getting in Diane's camp. So I'm going to stop reading this. I always like to read the other side, whether somebody's guilty, not guilty. Yeah. I always like to read the other side just to give them the benefit of the doubt of could it be true? Could it not be true? I like to be open minded. Yeah, exactly. Like that's how justice gets served inevitably is that someone says, no, that doesn't sound right. And they look at all the facts. I mean, it's like science. When you're making a hypothesis, your intention is to prove yourself wrong and it should be the same way in law you should be able to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt and clearly someone has some doubt so i'm just so it's interesting how did she get from new jersey to california what happened there uh she probably fucked up again yeah like (laughs) no that's quite a trip full cross country i don't know like i couldn't find anything i just saw that they said okay bye have fun in chowchilla with the chowchilla bus kidnappers it's interesting right august 1993 that's like right after i was born (laughs) <laughs> so they're saying she can get out when in 2025 yeah is that the soonest uh yeah that's only three years away man although she has failed like multiple parole hearings thank god we have to watch some because she's wild and she's like my parents are dying and i need out oh that's why they moved her never mind i do know because she wanted to be closer to her parents in california because oh. they were dying so she wants to get on parole now to like chill with her dying parents that she hates and abused her okay Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. i'm just curious i'll have to go to the site and read the opposing party's views of we should have a debate why she's innocent like i i always like to see both sides i would hope that if anything happened to me in the future somebody would look at both sides and not just pigeonhole one oh you bet your ass i'd be the one being like she's innocent and i'm here to tell you why (laughs) (laughs) so how old is uh christine now uh so when did we say she was born 83 no god no 82 i think seven when it happened let me get my story straight she was born in the 70s i think oh here we go cheryl Um, christy was 74 okay so she's way old enough now now have we Mm -hmm. like follow have you followed up on her at all is she Mm -mm. like mentally okay is she married she moved on i mean all i I wonder if she talks to her mom uh okay so i want to say one of her surrogate daughters does but the ones her like full was raised by her until the murder children don't from what i could find and they stay low one of her surrogates to talk to her i'm thinking that she actually is the mother of that child by i think it was jennifer i'm pretty sure it was jennifer that she still talks to interesting right well i mean you know i feel for these children and that's why i was asking about christy like is she okay if she's got to face this in three years i hope this young lady has had all of the help and support yeah. and counseling she needs it's just sad i always think we all like to watch and see why these people did these things but then at the other end is Someone the victims yeah and the families this and isn't just a story to them like it, this is their yeah, life it always makes me wonder how are they doing and how is she doing in three years from now when her mom gets out does she have all the support that she needs i hope she does is and she if gonna you're go? her friend please give her extra support so no matter if that mom talks to her again or not just knowing she's out of prison's going to affect her well and i'm curious to see if she's going to show up the hearing and be like fuck that dude keep her in there like she sucks or she's gonna be like yeah my mom learned her lesson let her out or she's even gonna show up i would not blame her a little bit if she said no i already testified against her once so i'm good wait she was born in like 55 i think so it's 45 plus 25 about 70 so she'll be 70 yeah diane's 69 right now so if she gets denied it'll be another few years so Mm -hmm. it would be good to keep her for a few more times yeah fuck it let her ride it out man 
anyway <laughs> anyways guys yeah, thanks for uh joining us <laughs> sorry about the extra talking <laughs> i'm not <laughs> <laughs> if you like the content like this please feel free to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're currently listening and leave a review on either pod chaser <laughs> thank you astra <laughs> apple podcasts or spotify it really helps us figure out what's working for you guys and what you want to see change you can also follow us on instagram where we post content daily updates giveaways the whole shebang and our dms are also always open so if you guys want to hear a certain story or offer suggestions or if you do know christy and she's doing great we want to know and, and give her some support guys please god please support her and Danny. Anyway, slide in the DMs if you want. We also have our website, cx3podcast.com. We have a blog. We're posting our transcript. We're actually starting a victim memorial page as well. That way we can kind of like honor the victims that we talk about. And it would be really cool if you guys wanted to like post anything about the victims Just on there. Just some love or... and support, please. Exactly. So. Because we would all want that if the same thing happened to us. Anyway, have a good day. Have a safe day. And always watch your back. Take Bye. care, guys. Bye.